Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Great Mind series. In this series, I'm thrilled to introduce two exceptional guests who have made significant impact in our study of consciousness. First, let's give a warm welcome to Professor Thomas Metzinger, a distinguished philosopher renowned for his influential work, Being No One and the Ego Tunnel. His profound contribution to the philosophy of mind are truly revolutionary, inviting us to deeply reconsider our concept of self and consciousness. Joining him is the one and only Professor Carl Fristens, a pioneering neuroscientist whose work has reshaped our understanding of the brain. His theory on predictive coding and the free energy principle are challenging the game in cognitive neuroscience. Together, they are here to take us on a deep dive into phenomenology of pure consciousness. Welcome, Professor Metzinger, and welcome, Professor Fristin. Good evening. Good evening. So let's get started. I'm going to hand over um, the the mic to Professor Metzinger mm -hmm. to start the conversation today. Thank you. Oh, how do I do that? Uh, I didn't <laughs> know I was the moderator. So <laughs> the first thing that came comes to mind is... <clears throat> I learned a very nasty and funny term uh, from a 2014 publication of Karl's, actually, namely that of a philosopher's. Uh, and uh, I've suffered from this all my life. Uh, I think the image in the Anglo-Saxon world is, is that if you're not intellectually fertile anymore, uh, if, if you don't bear fruit anymore, then you start to think about philosophy. And that was also uh, one thing Carl said he saw coming in his life, that he would start to think about consciousness and philosophical issues. And then I thought, well, I've been in a philosopher's uh, ever uh, for all the time uh, I can think of in my life. How did it go on, Carl? Uh, are you... Are you turning towards consciousness and soft issues now? As you feared in 2014, you, you said you wanted to fight this off. How's it going? <laughs> I, I'm not sure whether I'm still resisting effectively, but it's very sweet that you remember that. It's, it's something that I saw overtake my friend Chris Frith. Um, so he, we had a promise. I, I can't remember whether we promised that we'd... Um, be over the age of 50 before we did consciousness research. Okay. <laughs> and and he, he reached 50 at several years before I did, and, and within within literally months was the president of uh, the, the Society for the Study of Consciousness of this and all, all that, and took it terribly seriously. So, you know, um, am I, uh, yeah, I, I, I wish I, I wish I was a philosopher. I, th I think philosophers have, have the great, uh, the greatest of times. And I, uh, uh, and, uh, you clearly celebrate having your philosophers probably from adolescence. Um, I'm, um, as I become more involved, I, I, I realize it's probably best to be a spectator. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm still waiting basically. <laughs> but, yeah. but, my, my my credential, but I, I I do enjoy um I do enjoy the philosophy uh, well generally philosophy it's only philosophy of consciousness as a spectator sport I think it's absolutely intriguing and very entertaining. Well, unfortunately, it has become very politically political lately. So, um, I was one of those people who founded the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness in 1994. And I've seen it go through phases. And of course, there is some politics going on now, but we have a number of competing uh, theories on the table and uh, things are getting more strongly formalized. But we definitely need the help of people like you in many ways. Philosophers need it and uh, interdisciplinary consciousness researchers need it. And maybe... Maybe I can just start by throwing some things at you where I could, where I don't understand things and where I could use help. So <clears throat> I've been trying to develop this new approach. Uh, I edited this book on neurocorrelates of consciousness in 2000. 
And something dawned on me when Giulio Tononi recently said to me, come on, Thomas, the NCC approach is dead. We know many neural correlates of consciousness. We have a lot of data. We've made great progress since you published that book. But we, we are not really closer to an understanding of consciousness. So there are different kinds of scientific explanation. And uh, what I'm proposing now is to try a minimal model explanation, which is one type of explanation, which is known in theory of science, and it has been carried through in targets in physics and chemistry and evolutionary biology. And I would like to ask the question, what is the simplest form of conscious experience we know? And over the last three years, I've made some first moves in that direction, um, taking the experience of pure awareness and meditation as an entry point, and done some first psychometric studies there, and some conceptual spade work and everything. And so here is one thing. Um, I have a wildly speculative intuition, and um, I wonder if you can share this. I think the the strongest, biophysically strongest signal the cortex has to deal with and explain away is actually um, the ascending reticular activation system that wakes you up in the morning. And I think the experience of pure awareness in meditation is somebody, something everybody knows, also people who have never meditated, for example, from the first 200, 300 milliseconds when you wake up in the morning. I don't know if that makes intuitive sense to you, but if you wake up in the morning, um, you are, there's a short period where you are open to the world. You know that something can be known, but you're not oriented to place, not oriented to time, not oriented to person. You do not yet know who you are. Your autobiographical self model is not yet online. Now, I think this experience of waking up is actually a pretty dramatic event in the brain. Uh, the mechanism by which the system reactivates itself uh, must be actually a much stronger internal stimulus than anything that comes in, say, through the thalamus or uh, sensory channels. And um, that explaining away that completely unexpected perturbation, which does not come through any of the perceptual channels, that that may have something to do with understanding what consciousness the awareness really is. Now, here's my problem. If I look at this as a philosopher, I see beings like us have a wake-sleep cycle, and they have to control it. The level of cortical arousal has to be controlled. And then in papers which are much more in your ballpark, I read things like model-based control and non-model-based control. And whenever I read this, I don't fully understand it. So if you, I think there must be two ways in which human beings can control the process of waking up in the morning or sleep-wake cycle. One that is based on some low-level mechanism and one that actually involves an explicit model uh, or activates such a model for a certain time. Can you just explain to me what the difference between model-based control is and control that's not based on a model? Because it's something I never understand. I'm probably the worst person to ask that question of because I don't understand it either. Um, so. I'll give you an honest and, and simple answer to your question. The distinction between uh, model-based and model-free comes from um, reinforcement learning, a view yes, of yes. the brain um, that inherits very much from behaviorism, um, formalized uh, in terms of um, things like Riscora-Wagner uh, rules, 
adopted by machine learning in in the in the spirit of Q learning and um, state action policy optimization. So this is just about controlling motor plans. It's just about or maximizing reward um, in the sense of reinforcement learning. The behaviors that are reinforced by reward are more likely to occur. So in this very limited understanding of sense making, um, uh, or well, in this limited um, um, formulation of sentient behavior, or at least just behavior, um, you are trying to understand everything in terms of um, maximizing some utility function, some some reward function. Um, there are a number of ways you can do that, and that's where the distinction between model-free and model-based um, emerges. But very simply, model-free is just learning some direct mapping from your sensorium, from your uh -huh. sensory input, to an action. Um, you can have a slightly more elaborate mapping that is contextualized by some internal representation, a model of the... Um, the consequences of a particular action um, and thereby e elaborate um, a state action mapping where the state is not what you sense but what you infer to be the case but i don't think either of those distinctions uh, gets anywhere close to understanding how we make decisions or how we make sense of the world um uh, you know, and I try not to use the distinction. It, you know, it's, it's a colloquial distinction that. Um, oh, well, I see. Um, so everything, um, it, 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 you know, certainly on a twenty-first century view, or the kind of view that would you, know, you would get from something like the free energy principle, everything is model-based in the simple sense that, yeah. um, well, if you commit to the view that we model our lived world, or at least our sensed world. Um, yeah. And then the question is, you know, what kind of model, um, what necessary features of that model would you have to have to have um, different kinds of sentience or consciousness? Um, sometimes you become so habitual in your behavior, it looks like a model-free kind of behavior, but almost paradoxically, the model-free uh, kind of habitual automatic response actually supervenes on a very you know, a learned model based way or oh, i behave like that in this context and therefore i am going to do this automatically and quickly uh, i see so i think uh, you you you'll have you'll have to ask the question again um yes and i have an idea uh, I'll, I'll just ask you take a different corner so when i wake up in the morning there's a distinct phenomenology that is pre-autobiographical self-model, pre-self-localization um, in a spatial-temporal frame of reference. There is something to be experienced. Just let's call it pure wakefulness. But then there are certain types of coma patients who have what I think is today called um, unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. The German word would be wach coma, a waking coma. And of these patients, we can rationally assume that they are not conscious in any sense. Um, they do not know that they exist, but they do have a sleep-wake cycle, cycle. And they will do low-level, perhaps draw the linen of a bed sheet a little bit, and sometimes there will be gaze-following movement through the room, which is very difficult for the relatives um, to come to terms with that there might be nobody there. So what is the difference uh, if an unresponsive wakefulness syndrome coma patient wakes up in the morning and when you and I wake up, do you have an idea what the difference might be? I'm going to take your question as a leading question and say it's about the depth of planning, um, the narrative. Uh, you uh, mentioned a lovely phrase, the autobiographical self. So in the absence of an autobiographical self, but in the absence of some narrative um, that entails the context and a deep kind of planning, so what will happen if I do that, I think you could quite easily account for the kind of behaviour that you see in this um, you know, waking coma. So reflective uh, behaviors that don't um, um, speak to any long-term 
uh, modeling of what would happen if I did that. Um, not being aware of the context that has implications for the way that I behave, you know, for example, mm-hmm. you know, who is in the room and the like. So I think you would be, um, you know, to put this very simply, um, you would be operating under a kind of model of the world where there was, um, which would be appropriate to describe that as, you know, of something that couldn't plan, say, um, a thermostat or, um, you know, a, a life form that did not have this depth and this um, autobiographical, this narrative that extended in time. And crucially, um, the, by extending forward, being future pointing, be contingent upon or conditioned upon what I am doing. So there would be no sense of what to do next. Absolutely. Uh, Two terms I found very inspiring coming from a different universe uh, in trying to read your papers. One was temporal depth uh, and another one was counterfactual depth. And uh, I was wondering the emergence of phenomenal experience is there a necessary link in your view to temporal depth or to counterfactual the, the how does one say in english the capacity for counterfactuality is there a link there yes i i think there is absolutely a link yeah uh, I, and i'm i'm i'm, I'm smiling because because i'm cheating because i read your book so <laughs> i know <laughs> i know the answer <laughs> i'll pretend i haven't yes absolutely um your homework. Uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, the 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 the, 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 the if we now think about a, a special kind of model, and I should just say, now I can reinterpret your question question about model based and model free. I think if we now say, um, do we have a model of the future? Do we have the model of the consequences? of my actions that would i think be necessary to um be an agent and one could argue even to have um certain uh certain levels of consciousness um then i think the distinction between sort of model free and model based in a nuanced way in the context in which we're talking uh-huh. now is about do we have a model of self um uh, specifically the consequences of self acting in the world um and what if i if if one did have that kind of model what attributes would it require well first of all you're absolutely right how far into the future does this model go you know you know put it very simply um how far what is the temporal horizon of my planning now something okay. like you and me could uh, would plan you know certainly minutes hours days and possibly in terms of um uh, you know, looking forward to one's filler pause years in advance, if not decades. Um, whereas something like a, you know a bee or a, a a dog may not quite plan that for, uh, plan that far ahead, and something like a virus probably doesn't do much planning at all. So and that's one crucial dimension. But you also introduce another very uh, another really important dimension to the space of models that I could possibly entertain as a different kind of phenotype or as a, uh, in, in a different um, brain state or possibly mind mind state. Um, and that's not the temporal depth, but the breadth of the model, which I think is what you're referring to in terms of this counterfactual um, yes. attitude. So yes, I could take this path into the future and I could model it deep into the future to some horizon um, to a greater or lesser extent, depending upon whether I've just woken up or whether I'm... Uh, yeah, you know. yeah, absolutely. Um, but also, I have to enumerate the number of paths that I'm going to entertain as plausible paths into the future. I think that, you know, that's that's the counterfactual aspect. I think that's absolutely crucial. Um, as a sort of, um, with a, st- a statistical eye on things, as soon as you have counterfactual me's in the future, um you have to choose one to actually enact you have to commit we can only uh, physically act yes. with one thing we can't you know this is not a random variable it's not something i infer i can only physically move um in one direction at any one point in time so i have to do a selection amongst the counterfactuals and i think that's important this this act of selecting 
among my counterfactuals brings another aspect of agency to the table um, that you could mm -hmm. argue would not be there if there was just one path into the future. It's a bit subtle, but what I'm saying is that, you know, it is possible to have deep planning, um, but if you've only got one option, one narrative, one path into the future, yes. nothing to choose from. So that counterfactual richness or counterfactual breadth, perhaps, I think yes. is a really important aspect of, of, of the act of selecting what am I going to do, to, uh, what am I going to do next? I understand, but how dissociable are these two terms in, like in real world systems? Can there be a system that has a very large extended predictive horizon in a temporal sense and be counterfactually shallow or thin? Yes, I think so. I mean, it, you know, it, just to put some sort of clinical flesh on that, um, I think you can look at a lot of psychopathologies as having um, quite pronounced temporal depth, but quite narrow counterfactuality. So uh -huh. j just imagine uh, somebody with obsessional compulsive disorder um, yes. ah. is, you know, ha has lost the latitude to not do what they always do. So literally getting stuck in a rut. So, you know, thinking of this counterfactual depth as the, the 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 latitude you have to entertain different ways of responding to situation. Sometimes we lose that, and indeed, when I was talking about for about automizing or habitizing certain behaviors, that would be a loss of yeah, you know, a very functional loss. You know, if the situation doesn't change, you can uh, you know you can be extremely efficient and pays optimal um, just by doing the right thing in this context and the same thing every time. But that does speak to a loss of this um, this other way of, of, of doing things. So I think you can have, um, I mean, you know, just to qualify this, obviously um, the, the longer the path, the more the different paths you can take. So yes, obviously they do go hand in hand to a certain extent. If I have uh, just one time step ahead, um, I'm less likely, very much in the sense of a sort of deep tree search, I'm less likely to um, have many paths to explore. But I think there, you, know, you can think of situations where there's only one thing you can do, um, even if you actually pursue that plan, that policy, um, quite, you know, a, 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 quite a long way into the future. Thank you very much. That's That, that was really helpful. Now, let us think about these meditators, um, these committed practitioners in 57 countries we have researched. Um, they try to minimize their predictive horizon to the extent that it's not only that they want to rest in the now and in a thoughtless state, but actually, which is a subtle difference, they report that temporal experience as such vanishes at a certain point. It's timeless. It's not even nowness. At the same time, empirical research into such people um, talks about neuroplasticity of increased cognitive flexibility. Does, is this intuitive for you in any sense? Yes, yes. I don't remember reading quite about about that, but it does make absolute sense. In the, you know, so that cognitive um, flexibility, I think, speaks exactly to the opportunity to uh, entertain different hypotheses about what will happen to me or what mm -hmm. I will do in in, in the future. I, I immediately, I'm I'm drawn to um, sort of related conversations with. Um, Robin Carhart Harris about mm. um, metaplasticity and sort of broadening that landscape of possibilities into the future just by relaxing the very precise priors that that, that can sometimes keep um, keep you in a rut. Um, mm. And I think exactly the same picture in my head is apt to describe you know both both of those perspectives. Um, uh, so. Um, yeah, you know, and it's worthwhile noting we've moved very much into the sort of high level conceptual issue, but the uh, issues uh, and perhaps it, you you should just take a, a moment just to mm -hmm. um, just for people not not familiar with the the, the, uh, the narrative. I'm sorry, story I'm we're talking about. Yes, could you connect the you know 
you were talking before about the importance of neuromodulators and the um, the activation, say, of the reticular activating system or the ascending um, neurotransmitter systems um, as being a key kind of control. I think that's absolutely critical. Um, and in my world, that would set the precision. And I mentioned that just because I, I use ah. precision to, to actually, uh, the, the, the tuning that allows you to attend to or to switch on or switch off things like the depth of planning or the or the latitude of of planning. So I think there's a really important mechanistic link between what you're talking about before in terms of the sleep wake cycle that does indeed rest upon mm -hmm. um, these um, lawful um, dynamics that control the activate the activity of um, noradrenergic and cholinergic systems. And exactly the same systems uh, people um, believe are responsible for shaping the counterfactual breadth and, and the temporal uh, depth of the models that we're talking about. But I, I wonder if I can just ask you to to wax lyrical, just to set the scene for, for people. Yes, okay. <laughs> so um, on a personal note, you may know that... Uh, I have done a lot of private research in both realms, in both what Robin Card Harris does, and I'm also a long-term committed practitioner of meditation myself of 47 years. So some of the things that strike me are that, you know, we have in invented important things in the West. Uh, we have democracy, we have human rights, uh, we have found the scientific method, but there's something we don't have. Something mostly Buddhism, Asian cultures have developed to a great depth, which are non-propositional, non-theoretical techniques of trying to acquire knowledge and of um, trying to understand the conscious mind. And I often, sometimes I think that Tibetan Buddhists between 800 and 1200 uh, may have been closer to the essence of consciousness than we are in the ASSC today. There's a great depth. And if you look there over the centuries, one example is enlightenment is a wrong translation of the term Bodhi by a German scholar. It actually means awakening. So uh, they talk about the experience of what they call ever fresh wakefulness, for instance, in their traditional scriptures, which is important. So there's a, a cyclical renewing element, something like re-entry in it. Um, they talk about timeless wakefulness um, and a global process of awakening not about enlightening, enlightenment with metaphors of light. And that fits so nicely with a lot of empirical candidates uh, we have today. And um, the question is, if any of this can be bridged, um, because we have a historically new situation. For centuries, those people who practiced these completely different forms of trying to understand the human mind were deeply anchored in what I call models of mortality denial. They were in a Hinduistic or a Buddhist context. They, did, um, they uh, um, believed in reincarnation. There was clearly a metaphysical and a uh, background and a large degree of irrationality also in it. Now, these practices have spread all over the planet. In our data set for our study, we have people from 57 countries. And it's very interesting. It's a historically new epoch. What will people with very different backgrounds and people who call themselves spiritual but not religious or call themselves atheists, will they have a common core? And... Um, of our first data set, there were 12 statistical factors, and one which I find theoretically most interesting is factor eight, which describes a non-egoic form of self-awareness. So they say in consciousness as such, 
if you leave away the content, there is a reflexive structure that is built in there. And it is not the structure of a self, of an ego, of an agent. It's, in a certain sense, it has nothing to do with you uh, who thinks about it. And that's very interesting. And um, maybe we can go there. Um, a distinction I found important, and I, I'm sure you've said a lot about it, is the computational self-model versus the phenomenal self-model. So I have written a lot for more than three decades uh, about the emergence of a phenomenal sense of self and the egoic self-model of ourselves as an acting self in the world, as a self that has mental action policies that can control attention, can set epistemic goals and decide what it wants to know and so forth. That's all. There's the embodied self. There is what Anil Seth would call introceptive self-modeling. You know, the introceptive prediction has many, many layers. But then in your framework, everything is a self-model in a different sense, right? So, for instance, if we just take my conscious model of reality right now, this room, your face, everything I experience, it is actually only own states, local states, uh, that are modeled and predicted by the system. Um, although some of them have become so reliable that I use them as models of external reality, they become transparent. So what is the relationship between a computational self-model and a phenomenal self-model? Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, yes, I, I suspect we share the same thoughts. So, um, so technically, um, everything that um, we work with in terms of simulating or trying to um, understand the computational architecture and the structure of belief updating rests upon a generative model. In that sense, there's only one generative model. But of course, a model of what? And you know, there can be many different domains, and you mentioned a number of them. There will be a domain of this model that is um, particularly appropriate or good at predicting interceptive uh, consequences or states of, states of the body, and that would correspond to interceptive inference in exactly the way that um, Anil Seth would um, would be happy with. You would have you had models of your, um, your your embodied self, um, which would involve um, you know, a forward or a generative model of um, the consequence of actions so, and you know, predicting proprioceptive input. Um, there will be um, a model of the external world as um, it impresses itself on your visual and auditory and other extraceptive uh, modalities. Uh, that is used to make sense of that in you know in the standard predictive processing of course, of course yes. uh, kind of way. So when I talk about a generative model, it's it's all um, you know it covers all of these things. I think what you're talking about um, is um, some a special kind of ge a generative model that is probably unique to higher life forms and possibly you know the, the depth that you're talking about now. So now we're talking about. Um, um, a third kind of depth. So you know, we've done the depth in time, the degree to which we plan. Uh, you know, are we um, are we modelling the the, um, the moment, or are we modelling an extended trajectory? We've done the counterfactual depth, as it were, in terms of the latitude that we have to um, explore different ways or entertain different uh, things. But now we've got a hierarchical depth. But I think it's going to be very crucial for. for, for oh, I see. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, you know the, the notion of a self model um, immediately entails something that ha that is deep in a hierarchy that is sitting atop all of these um, initially amodal, but then increasingly modal or specialized, so interceptive, proprioceptive, extraceptive. Um, so the, you know the, the this very deep model. This, um, if you like, at the centre of a centripetal hierarchy, is 
I think, going to be much more concerned with the planning that we were talking about. If, you know, if there is agency in play that has this aspect of uh, temporal depth that necessarily acquires a kind of selfness to its attribute because it it is you know consequent on the actions of the of the mm -hmm. thing is the model it's okay. not your your um actions it's my actions so i may not know that i may not be aware that i am a thing and i am an agent but of course if i had something on top of that looking down then the hypothesis i am an agent now starts to make a lot of sense of what's going on underneath um you also introduced a really important notion which is the um the uh, the notion of mental action so i've been talking about sort of um you know very prosaic kinds of plans you know how am i going to what am i going to where am i going to look next how am i going to execute a saccadic plan for example over the next 250 milliseconds um and these are acts ac that these are actions that are evinced by either um straight in muscle or there could be smooth muscle it could be sort of autonomic responses i could secrete something that, so we're getting now to back to interceptive inference um but you've brought to the table another really important kind of action which is a covert action uh an, an internal action so what could that be well it's just really selecting the um and all the machinations and the sense making that underwrites my planning so what would that look like to a psychologist it would look like attention um yeah. so that tells you immediately that um you know if the buddhists have got it right that whatever they're doing that they, they become skilled at deploying their internal mental actions through becoming skillful possibly volitionally so in terms of deploying attention and just open brackets of course this is where all those uh modulatory neurotransmitters get into the game yeah. physiologically that's you know that's how it actually um exert this kind of mental action um and what would that what would that bring to the table well it would bring to the table um the a control over my sense making you know if i can attend to if i can act upon say interceptive um uh, processing uh, predictive processing in the interceptive domain or indeed in the extraceptive domain if I now can predict the precision or the the, uh, the confidence uh, that I'm going to afford this kind of information that's coming up from this part of the of the genetic model, I'm now um, acting in a way that would look exactly like you know um, um, attending to this and attending to that, um, but also I'm now in control of my own perception. Uh, and I think that's um, coming back to, to to another very important thing that you you, you um, um, introduced, which is this notion uh, this, this this notion of where does the the phenomenology come from? Um, so I'm now going to throw it back to you because I yeah I I think that 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 ability to act upon our own sense making, our own evidence accumulation, our own self-modeling in its most general sense um is a key to understanding um certain phenomenology in the sense of opacity and transparency but uh, and now i'm going to pass it back to you just to unpack what that means yes uh, so my head is exploding in different directions right now uh, one part once to ask if active inference is not actually a misnomer. Um, we'll postpone this for a minute. Another part wants to say that what is really interesting in these Buddhist practices is actually meta-attention. So um, if you have, I don't know, uh, likelihood precision, you would be able to say all oh, this much clearer. Um, if if you have the capacity to add a second level that asks how is my attention currently distributed over perceptual act uh, uh, per perceptual objects and how does it fluctuate what is the uh, first order attentional landscape then you re realize not theoretically but on a meditation cushion that there is no agent there actually that there is no control um, that you've always had this 
first order model of what in my terminology is attentional agency there's a little fictitious entity um, that's conjured up of somebody who can control the focus of attention but if you in uh, not cognitively but by attention introspect that you see there is no entity in control and if that is stabilized and deepened it may dissolve certain hyper priors for instance the one that there's always a subject and an object it may lead to a non-dual form of attention to a form of attention where the meditator has vanished where the knowing self has disappeared um let me just stop there because um i have so much to say there do you think that by adding an extra layer of what we call attention one could also dissolve assumption about first order mental actions that were completely natural before does this make sense to you yes that makes perfect sense uh, and just to um join the dots i mean the notion of meta attention so this meta next to implies exactly the kind of hierarchical depth that, that, that we were you know that I, I was talking about and you were alluding to before that putting you know something on top of or next to um, um so you can talk about first and second and higher order attentional mechanisms i think that's a really crucial concept uh, and, mm. and quite subtle uh, and i'm mindful of people like lars uh Sanford smith um sort of trying to formalize this and you know it really is to my eye to my eyes the high church or the high end of of um generative modeling to actually get get uh so it, it always takes me a few minutes just, just to try and understand uh you know the um the subtlety of having these deeply structured attentional mechanism attending to attending but let yeah. me answer your question this um I, I i that makes perfect sense to me in the sense that the notion of self um um versus object or just even minimal the you know, notion of uh, a minimal self but in and of itself um is a fantasy and it's a gift and i'm sure that you know we spend um much of the first few um months of our life um, um crafting uh -huh. this fantasy uh cool. and you know it 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 it, 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 it may be only for a privileged few um to actually see it disintegrated and see it for the fantasy and the hypothesis hypothesis for which it is um well i say a fortunate few and i had in mind people who have become skilled uh, at meditation and being able to um now have this kind of meta attention and meta meta attention possibly uh, but of course you could you know it could also be very unfortunate if you've got something like depersonalization of course you know yes um, it, you know, so it's not it's not necessarily a gift it's it'd be a gift if you become skilled in it so you can realize that this is just a, a hypothesis it's just a fantasy you know me as an agent is this a useful um I illusion or hypothesis that explains, explains so much but to see that you're absolutely right you'd have to stand one step back and have this kind of um hierarchical depth i think yeah too. but a minimal correction you don't see it and you don't stand back <laughs> so maybe we should give a little so I don't know if you know this, but Lars Sandvet Smith and myself, we are both committed practitioners of meditation for years. And we've had a series of long conversations uh, um, over the last years. And we thought it would have value to put a first predictive processing model of how we think it works out, not because we think that's the truth. We think it's highly tentative. Um, but to get the computational phenomenology of pure awareness going to start a more rigorous scientific debate so i don't know if there are show notes here but there's a website that's called mpe-project.info and there you can look uh, a little to a little greater depth into two proposals how a full absorption episode in a med meditator in pure awareness would look and how it would look to experience awareness itself while perceptual processing is still going on. So maybe that's of interest for some of our listeners. 
for me, it looks like that. The core, the essential core of this hierarchically deep human self model is what I call the epistemic agent model. That's that fictitious entity that decides the knowing self that also decides what it is going to know in the future, that sets targets, epistemic targets, directs attention, thinks, simulates. If that dissolves, interestingly, there is still a phenomenal quality of knowingness. There can be, our data clearly show, an uncontracted quality of epistemicity of knowingness. We have this idea that likelihood precision may go through all levels and that we may see this. Does this, all of this make any sense to you? If somebody, somebody comes and says, I was almost absent, but there was an uncontracted quality of knowingness. Could there be a computational phenomenology of a state like that? I think so. And I, I think you're, you're, you're probably getting very close or at least sketching it um, in a compelling way. Um, I would, I would, um, I'd like to know um, how one could marry that with this depth that we were talking about before, because you, uh -huh. you, know, you, you, you use phrases like sort of planning what to know. So you're talking about your know, epistemic action. So you know there is no epistemics without acting. Um, you can't resolve your uncertainty. You can't update your beliefs in the absence of sampling some new evidence, whether it's internally or overtly. So again, we come back to the crucial um, role um, of plans and what I am going to do. So it is nice that um, I think that very nicely um, ties in. So one obvious place to start thinking about modeling um, um, uh, a, a minimally uh, phenomenal experience or minimal kind of consciousness would be just to shrink the temporal depth. Now, what would yes. that look like? Well, it would mean that I'm no longer worried about the future. I am in the moment because I am not now through these modulatory, through these precision um um nuancing mechanisms i have now put uh, i have now inferred that i am in a state of mind where there is no real future um the future can still hold alternatives so I'm, i i i you've used a phrase in the past called the possibility of knowing and i think that's very important so yes it's not uh it's I, extra I, space yes and i think i think that the, the possibility of knowing without actually worrying about what i'm going to do uh, and what I want to know, uh, what I want to discover epistemically, I think that that would be captured by um, a um, a set of hypotheses that had counterfactual breadth, but no temporal depth at all. So that there will be nothing to... Super interesting. That is very interesting. Um, because yogis who have never seen a high school or a university actually speak about the space of all possibilities and things like this. Um, that is a, a very interesting twist uh, on this. Although meditation researchers also distinguish between what they call dual mindfulness and non-dual mindfulness. So dual mindfulness is when you still sit on this cushion, comfortably, peacefully relaxed, rest in the now without any past or future but it is still you having that experience and then there is another one of our participants described as nobody sitting on the cushion everything sitting on the cushion um, so there's also a non-dual form of heightened attention or a non-dual form of having a model, a representation, as you say, of the possibility of epistemic gain, the possibility of knowledge. Um, but it is not someone who has this experience. Is this at all intuitively intuitive to you? Could that be conceptually modeled, formally modeled? 
probably um yeah i, I think it can um and uh, i suspect you you've already tried to do it but um <laughs> so this is um can I just ask, though, because uh, I came across another really interesting notion. Uh, what's the relationship between non-dual and zero person as opposed to first person? Ah, very good. So, yeah, but you've, you've grasped it. So for beings like us, there is a very high level prior that there is always a subject and an object. And there are very few states of consciousness at all in which there's not a representation of a subject and an object to the degree that many philosophers as with a lack of imagination have thought is impossible that there should be non-subjective consciousness there's the whole idea why consciousness should be irreducible is that it is tied to an individual first person perspective which cannot be reductively explained you know that there's always some sense even if it is only non propositional of a self having this experience it's perspectival i think that's false that's it's empirically shown uh, that that is false now the zero person perspective would be the epistemic perspective an information processing system can have that operates under a conscious model of reality but has no subject object prior and um, this sounds so abstract but i always try to explain to explain it to people there's something we overlook um, i call this the single embodiment constraint we are systems where all sensors and effectors are located in one narrow physical space. And uh, our model of, through millions of years of our evolution, our model of reality always had, you know, to serve the procreation of a single embodiment, sustaining the existence of a single embodiment. So it has this deeply ingrained quality of centeredness. Uh, there might be different ways to describe it. And, and what I'm pointing out is, is this is not a necessary condition in a conceptual sense. Human beings are actually capable of knowing from a zero person perspective, you know, where there is no high level self, there may be there's a body model still there. Um, but where there is no epistemic agent model in the in the experience there's nobody knowing maybe it's the world seeing itself there are different metaphorical descriptions of that so i don't know if that clarifies the the connection between zero person perspective um as something we haven't thought about but which i think is an absolutely it's a computational and a conceptual possibility and it's empirically validated actually now, let me test out a thought experiment with you. Imagine we had a conscious AI that had non-dual awareness. It was conscious. It had a massive model of reality, um, but no egoic sense of self. But it would, it, uh, does one say in English, administrate or administer? Administrate, say, thousands of epistemic agents robot bodies walking the surface of the earth it could see through the senses through the eyes through all these localized epistemic agents thousands of robots maybe even in outer space but its own model of reality would be non-dual it would use the epistemic agent models in all of these subsystems, all of these robots wandering around to gather data, to improve its model of reality, but it would itself remain in a non-dual state. Is that conceivable for you? Or do you think as soon as you control local epistemic agents, <laughs> the perspectivalness creeps in? I think it does. Um in the sense that to have a perspective you have to look and to look is an act and an act has to be planned so you could not control an epistemic agent unless again you um you bring controllers inference in, into the picture 
So what you're talking about with you know in this thought experiment with this um, um, non-dual um, controller of the um, peripheral mm -hmm. multitude of epistemic agents, um, that this um, controller has to have uh, a deep generative model. Uh, however, um, at this stage, we have not elaborated the meta attention or the or, or the kind of depth that, that he would know or have any hypothesis that it was even a thing, let alone <laughs> subject. Um, you'd have to equip that with, with, with the extra the, the the extra depth. So, um, I mean, you know, in a sense, what you've just described is is very much how we would actually build a hierarchical generative model of the brain, where the multiple epistemic agents are just low level. Um, usually domain specific um sensory you know sensory systems um yes um that would, would you know that can all do that sort of low level planning you know we don't have to um we don't have to um locate the planning um to um you know a, an autobiographical narrative self that would be propositional i could i, I could be mm -hmm. aware of in some sense you know it could be right at the level of i repeat the control of saccadic eye movements you know these have to be planned they, they have to be they, they, I, they're, they're to my mind a beautiful example of an epistemic um um sub agent you know the mm -hmm. way that we can skillfully choose where to look to resolve uncertainty about what's over there or what's over there based upon our prior beliefs you know it's abs and we do that you know every 200 milliseconds i mean it's, yes. and the computations if you ever try to put this into a computer uh, it's astounding how efficient we do this epistemic foraging and this this kind of planning so but um but, but we don't have any volitional control over that and and it you know it, it would be a little bit like one of your um, one of your thousand epistemic agents out there in the world doing their own thing in the right kind of way to coordinate that um, would require some longer term more narrative planning of the sort I think that you probably is close to the notion of autobiographical uh, an autobiographical ah, to administrate a multitude of low level epistemic agents you think it would have to creep in yes let me use the occasion you know you speak about active inference and for years, I'm haunted by the idea that this might be conceptually a slight misnomer because I'm asking myself, where does actually the word active come from? Um, is there really an agent? Because it smells a little bit like ultimate origination. It smells like a first cause to extend into the world through active sampling or something like this. What is active about active sampling? Before, let me just give you some background. Philosophers have l written big books about actions and events. So the idea is the physical universe is made up out of events, many think, local property instantiations. And the question is if some events are also actions, which means that there is an explicit goal, uh, goal directedness, a goal representation, and so on, maybe even a person. Um, many philosophers would say only persons act in a meaningful sense, all the rest is behavior. But um, another possibility, a radically reductionist possibility, is actions do not exist in this universe. All that exists is events and behaviors say unintentional behaviors now in that wider context is there any hidden little cartesian agent in the concept of active inference what is active in there is there an element of causal spontaneity isn't it basically all just dynamical self-organization Yes. Um, well, or, or no. Yes. Um, no. <laughs> That's the answer I wanted to have. That's exactly <laughs> the answer I wanted to have. <laughs> um, but it's a good question. Uh, yeah. Why active inference? It, um, I think it was just to emphasise the importance of um, closing the loop between the inside and the outside, um, uh, and to get away from um, an undue focus on predictive coding, which is not about 
um, how you go and sample or select data, but just how you make sense of data under some generative model, state mm -hmm. estimation, if you like. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, certainly in in the in the sort of neurophilosophy space, um, you know, predictive coding was was. Um, to many people's eyes, getting a little bit too much attention, and you know the the, the more inactivist or Andy Clark like uh, perspective needed to be brought in, which I think is why Andy introduced the word the phrase predictive processing, just to try and um, slightly divorce mm -hmm. that feel from predictive coding, just as a data assimilation or a Kalman filter like like tool. So active inference was was, was um, uh, just. Um, the word active was just to emphasize this is more than state estimation in, in engineering or data assimilation in statistics. It, it was the added and the glorious problem of you are now in charge of which data that you want to assimilate. Oh, of um, course, yes. And uh, so is there a, a, a little uh, Cartesian, um, is, is, is there a, a dualism there? The, the, absolutely. So, so obviously it's a, a sort of a dual aspect monism, but but uh, in fact, just practically, um, both the, the, the yes and the no aspects here. First of all, yes, it's just dynamics and yes it is just a succession of events um but that dynamics formally written as a random dynamical system if you're a physicist or knowledge run equation pertains to a particular partition of states and this is the markov blanket partition and as soon as you do that then you um have at hand a way of talking about um things that have active states that couple the inside i understand that um, so there is an inside there. Um, so there is a little bit of <laughs> there is a I, monkey. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't have to be. You, know, you can have you can have things that don't, don't have internal states. You indeed you can have things that don't have active states. Um, you know. Yeah, this is. Excuse me for interrupting. That was the question I had. But old-fashioned passive perceptual updating still does exist in your view. Oh yes. Yeah, it's. Yeah. It's not abolished, or so. Oh no, no! It's just it's just um, contextualized as uh, as part of a larger uh, circular causality or dynamics that are open um, um, in the sense that for the thing to um, exist in the environment in which it is embedded, um, it has to be open to that environment, and, the, and and as soon as you're open to the environment, the, you know traffic goes both ways. You act upon the environment, and the environment acts upon you. So that sensory assimilation, unconscious influence, if you like, in a you know in an explicit Helmholtzian sense, uh, is just that direction of traffic, and the action is just that direction of traffic. It's not. Uh, so for me, it's not. It's not. Um, it's not at all magical. In fact, you know, I, I can't imagine any interesting description by a physicist. Uh, so it's in the context, it's always in the context of an active state in the context of a Markov blanket. That's where yeah. the active interest. And nothing added on this. So no. here's a little warning for you. So I very much enjoyed last week of uh, reading the paper of Giovanni and Andy and you in Trends in Cognitive Sciences with Paul Cizek and Thomas Parr. Be careful with this inactivism crowd. Um, I claim nobody knows what inaction really is because it's a relational term. If we want to understand what that really means, A inacts B. I would just like to know what the A and the B is. And my deep suspicion is nobody can tell me this is poetry. In inactivism is poetry. Uh, and, um, I think it cannot be genuinely transformed into your formal framework, or do you have an idea how it could be done? Um, I don't really, because uh, I, you, you you use the, the nice warning, uh, beware of the inactivist crowd. If you're talking about the radical inactivist crowd, I, I've, <laughs> I've avoided them on advice. Uh, so I have no idea. So that's the kind of pause that I don't want to. Uh, I don't want uh -huh, to. Uh -huh. Um, but the, um, 
Well, there's something really important that you you, you said there, which um, I do think. Yeah, you you because you, yeah, I I take your point, and um, you, you know, I'd like to hear you and Maxwell Ramstead wax lyrical about sort of radical inactivism and, and its utility. <laughs> he's a he also likes the worst of German philosophy. He likes Heidegger. It's terrible. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, but before you um, you mentioned this notion of inactivism or active um, action as being goal pointing, um, and I thought that was that I think there is something um, a bright line that you have crossed as soon as you introduce the notion of goal pointing, because we're now immediately now talking about generative models that have a temporal depth where you are now working towards a goal that goal could be epistemic um mm -hmm. so I, I i do think there are different kinds of things all of which could be um in the terms of the physics um uh, described in terms of active inference but only a, a certain number of things could could sensibly be or in a non-trivial way be ascribed goal-directed behavior and i think it is exactly the kind of um the kind of models that we've just been talking about that have this temporal depth uh you know mm -hmm. so you know, you, you know the, the state of meditation is actually to suspend that goal pointing planning um mm -hmm. and just to you know enjoy being in the moment without any goals I and mean, it is interesting isn't it that you can't meditate or oh, perhaps i'm wrong here but my guess is that you couldn't really meditate and engage in lots of action at the same time and certainly that well, there are forms there is tai chi there's walking meditation it can be combined but i know exactly what it mean what you mean it can be done without identification um before I ask you, perhaps, because I I think we should also go to the general audience pretty soon, a last question um, I have. There is, in old analytical philosophy of mind, there is a conceptual distinction which you might find actually um, inspiring for your own work, namely between theoretical intentionality and practical intentionality. So theoretical or epistemic intentionality means that a system is directed at a set of truth conditions, right? It has something to do with knowledge. Practical intentionality would um, mean that it is directed at a, at a set of satisfaction conditions. And I sense, if that is intelligible to you, that your formalism might be able to integrate these two forms of intentionality in an interesting way and on a more fine-grained level um you don't have to do it now <laughs> but well no, no that's intriguing um so uh, we've got the recording i didn't know about that but that sounds formally identical to the epistemic and pragmatic affordances when you decompose the expected free yeah. energy the expected surprise that sounds almost identical uh, you uh, and the lovely thing is that you can derive that um that expected free energy that has this sort of um, intentional and pragmatic or instrumental aspect from the physics of these random dynamical systems under the under the special constraint that they are not aware of their own action, uh, so that now action becomes uh -huh. something that is inferred. Um, so things like you and me that can plan necessarily yes. now um, my do not have access simply because of this meta-attentional or deep uh, structure that the the actual mo muscles that I use or my my autonomic actuators are so far removed from these deep um, structures, say, for example, in the brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, you, know, you don't know what you are actually doing. You only know about the sensory consequences. And, of course, that mm -hmm. is the heart of the... Um, the um, the kind of planning and self-modeling that underpins the, um, the, the you know, either in the moment or or the autobiographical self. Um, so that's so. Um, in that sense, well, perhaps we should now go to the to the audi audience question. I, one question, and then we go to the general audience. <laughs> one question I still have. Um, I have a temporal ontology in my private life. And that temporal ontology says that the next week 
that starts next Monday or actually starts today, the last week of November is suicide week in my own ter terminology because this is where you get really depressed. I don't know how the weather is in England right now, but here it's suicidal already. It gets really dark and you know what is still ahead of you. And something that seems very obviously, I don't know if you've thought about it, to fall out of the, say, architectural proposals you are making and your colleagues are making, is um, that there inevitably will be um, more suffering than joy in any sentient life, in our own life. Because the general picture that emerges is that biophysically, this is all one big uphill battle. We are these anti-entropic systems in a very stochastic, volatile environment. Prediction error will never stop. Perturbation will never stop. And we even know that our predictive horizon is going to shrink to zero eventually. So this is actually not an attractive position to be in in this physical universe, right? So question A is... Do you agree that there will be necessarily more conscious suffering than attractive phenomenal states, joy in a normal human being, given the assumptions uh, you are making? And have you ever thought about suffering-free architectures, um, how one would realize conscious experience, at least without psychological suffering? Let's put it like that. Any thoughts on this? Well, in reverse order, I would imagine that meditation is probably the closest you get to it because you're not in this um, constant fight against entropy. Um, so I would imagine that being in the moment is really a way of suspending that, um, that those exist, you know, acting upon those existential imperatives by planning. Um, the sec answer to the second question um I, uh, which will be a little bit trivial, but uh, I think I can substantiate mathematically. I think that uh, <laughs> I think there's just as much suffering as joy, um, almost by definition. Um, um, if you allow me to um, read joy and suffering as valenced attributes of mind-brain states. Uh, that reflect the degree of surprise or expected surprise. Yes. 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 Um, so, you know, on that uh, on that view, then the joy is resolving the uncertainty. It is being curious. So it's sating that curiosity. So I think, in the absence of all these perturbations and all the capricious nature of the world in which we find this, we would actually be uh, we would be very we would have no joy because the joy is resolving by engaging yes. our curiosity so the very fact you're doing what you're doing in the suicide month of november <laughs> your curiosity and those of your audience i think speak <laughs> to the fact there's probably there's probably just as much joy as there is suffering in the world <laughs> that is the most perfect ending i think to our conversation first i just want to express to both of you dr Kristen and dr metzinger that it's a a real privilege for us more common people to actually be able to dialogue with you. Um, the, the, the statements I'm going to make, I'm going to do all together. They, I do have them written down, so I won't go on forever. Don't worry. Um, I wish we some were here, the same we some who spoke with you the prior time you were on Clubhouse, Dr. Kristen, um, who's in uh, neuroscience uh, at Harvard. Um, but he and I I have read almost all of the peer-reviewed literature of you of yours, um, Thomas, uh, that's in English from about 2000 uh, forward. And uh, I have to say that I don't think there's anyone who uh, meets the standards you have of both being a practitioner, being widely aware of Eastern philosophy, uh, being a philosopher and being a neuroscience. And uh, I, I, I I can't say enough. I mean, in a joking way, I just say I have a huge crush on you. And so do several of us uh, who have been reading your work. Um, so just based on exactly Thank where you the so conversation. Much. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, and we've pre-ordered <laughs> your book and uh, actually going to be reading the full thing on Clubhouse in a small group. 
Um, so uh, here we go. Uh, based on the things you said today, I'm going to give a small uh, a monologue and then see what you have to say. And then uh, Dr. Kristen, if you would. Uh, you started out um, acknowledging the experience of waking up. Um, I think my, my uh, suspicion is most people don't have that in their conscious memory, but some of us do. I'm one of them. It sounds like maybe you do, and your firsthand experience is very helpful. Um, you've also, uh, I know from some of the reading and listening I've done, you're, you have your own firsthand understanding of a lucid deep sleep. You made a really interesting comment this morning, which that you said that the experience of waking up could be very important because it's not triggered by perception, by which I assume you also mean uh, uh, exterior sensory perception. Now, just bear with me with those uh, those things in mind, because we're interested and we've been discussing recently the role of interoception uh, yes. and various things, in, yeah, including uh, things that people call spiritual experiences that most of the traditions say are, quote, uh, super sensory. Um, okay, just bear with me a little bit more. Um, okay, uh, I, we've also uh, been puzzled at a few moments about whether you are cognitivist, but it doesn't, doesn't seem like you possibly could. So everything I'm saying from my and Wiesen's perspective or from a non-cognitive perspective, um, with your idea of getting to somehow a very basic uh, experience that can show what pure consciousness is, so to speak, both of those prior two types of experiences, knowledge. You spoke of knowledge a few times. This is a very problematic word, uh, partly because in Western philosophy, it's defined as justified true belief, but also uh, the idea of knowing as being that occurs, say, in Advaita Vedanta, that I'm sure you're very familiar mm -hmm. with, as opposed to mental knowing. Um, so one of the things that we, Sam and I are discussing a lot is how do we really want to redefine knowledge? In a lot of your work, you've discussed this feeling of epistemicity that occurs in these very pure consciousness states. It's true. It's there. But what does it really mean if it's nothing like the way that we've usually used the word knowledge? And how does a feeling of knowing relate to necessarily very, very good. Knowing, Excellent. Yes. Knowing any, no, thank you. Knowing anything per se. And uh, of course, there's also what you brought up today. Uh, that if there, if, if we take knowledge as it has traditionally been dealt with in the West or in the epistemic sense in the East, then we have a knower and a known. And we're certainly not in a zero person perspective. So there's the whole question yes. of, of transiting into the first person. Um, yes. So the last thing I want to say is that we've read the full recent book uh, by someone you both know well, Ned Block, uh, The Border Between Seeing and Thinking. And right at that joint, uh, and this, this is the very last point, these things all relate, right at that joint between uh, perception and thinking, uh, he talks a little bit about things like he even mentions something called non-conceptual cognition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there's and all of this also seems to be relating to uh, a potentially interoceptive aspect of knowledge and consciousness. I hope you can just take all of that, say what you'd like to, and then uh, Dr. Christian, if you could as well. Thank you for all bearing with me, but these are things that several of us have been considering deeply for over a year. Thank you. So thank you very much. I, I noted six, and I'm trying to go through of them. You are right on target. So it is not true that I know the experience of um, lucid dreamless sleep well. Uh, I have only exactly had it one single time on a very long meditation retreat as a young man. So I know the phenomenon exists. I've never really basically had it since. Um, <clears throat> in an, how, how I would say in English, in an unequivocal way, um, but we are trying, there's one sub-project, sub and I should also say, for those people who don't know, there's this book, The Elephant and the Blind, that has a chapter on lucid dreamless sleep, and it will be freely available as an open access book to everybody on the 6th of February. Then you can follow up on this. Um, so 
what one of my greatest dreams is to demonstrate the existence of consciousness during non-REM sleep. Um, and we've taken some first steps uh, towards it, but it doesn't look good because the of the 1,183 1, subjects uh, we had in that uh, final cohort, only 25 reported even knowing um, witnessing sleep, as it is also called. And to get that into a sleep lab and produce it, on command, you know, not in a monastery or on a retreat will be very difficult. But that's one of the things I really want to do. Second, interception responsible for the process of waking up. Very good point. Hidden in this book, I have a thesis uh, that a possibility that many of my fellow meditators will actually hate. I think that pure awareness may be an extremely abstract and subtle form of bodily self-awareness, actually, but one which is not mediated through any form of internal receptor system. It's, so to speak, it's aware, some sort of unmediated, not receptor system mediated direct awareness of the brain itself. It's amodal. So I constantly have these discussions with my friend Anil Seth, who thinks the whole thing is anchored on the interceptive predictive mechanism machinery down there. But I think there is something more fundamental, something that does not depend on any sensory system in the guts or in the blood vessels. Um, and that that is actually um responsible for this experience of silent, clear wakefulness, and that it can be described as a form of body representation, actually. Now, two concepts, you are right on target this question with knowledge. Um, I could easily go on for three hours now, but just um, to illustrate this, in the book, I have introduced the term, the conception of the sea fallacy. The sea fallacy is if, if somebody thinks they have experienced consciousness as such, pure consciousness, uh, that the experience itself shows that they have, or the simplest state of consciousness. Of course, it doesn't. Science might find out that there are much more simple forms of phenomenality, maybe short flickers in non-REM sleep than the pure awareness experience. The second concept is what I call the E fallacy. Of course, the phenomenology of knowing doesn't license any claims, epistemic claims in any way. We have deep experiences of certitude in certain kinds of epileptic seizures. Uh, we have deep experiences of certitude in a number of serious psychiatric syndromes. We have them under psychoactive substances. So a robust and solid experience of knowing is as such doesn't show anything from a philosophical perspective. You're absolutely right to press this um, point. Um, on an, in another way, I think Carl will be able to say in what sense all brain states are epistemic states. Um, I think the formalism holds this promise, but it's of course not justified belief as your standard uh, analytical epistemologist in philosophy would have it. It's a much deeper and richer, it's maybe a statistical physics notion of what knowing actually means. And the last point I could still note, and then I'm done, is <clears throat> you asked about the transition from the first-person perspective, from the zero-person perspective back to the first-person perspective, which demonstrates to me that you have penetrated very deeply um, into these discussions uh, and into the, the problems behind them. You can illustrate this in a different way. If somebody says they have experienced a selfless state, which was a perspectival, a conservative analytical philosopher might come and say, this 
is has not to be taken serious in any way because it contains some sort of self-contradiction because how can you report an autobiographical experience uh, of something where you were not there as a self? How can there be an autobiographical memory of selfless states? There's something deeply puzzling there. And one could be very conservative and say this, this is contradictory. This, this is not data reports like this. We don't have to take it seriously. I have briefly flagged this problem in 20 years ago in being no one. And I can point you to one very good paper if you're interested. Yeah, please do that. Maybe I've read it. What is it? Oh, well, it's uh, Milier in the Raphael Milier, Selfless Memories in the Journal Erkenntnis. I don't agree, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a very good step forward on this issue. How can you at all remember a selfless state and talk to a scientist about it? Yeah, the best answer is to actually have the experience. But thank you for everything. I uh, deeply honor you, and I'm interested when you're done if Kristen has anything to say. Um, I'll just focus on a, a, a couple of those points. Um, but start by saying I love these the uh, C and E fallacies. Uh, it reminds me of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the, 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 the unknowability of certain things by definition. And you know, um, I, I think that that's a sort of uh, splendid way to think about it. I I think from a um, um, again a prosaic um, perspective of um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, the like. Um, that there may be a way of addressing that um, the, the, the distinction between knowing and believing that could speak to um, how one can report um, knowledge in the absence of being uh, the owner of that knowledge. And, but it is a very, very simple-minded distinction. So I, because I have not actually had my philopause, I don't have to use words like knowledge and belief in any learned or scholarly way. So in <laughs> my world, <laughs> a belief is just a posterior um, Bayesian belief structure about the current states of affairs causing my sensations. <laughs> knowledge is encoded in the parameters of a generative model. So if I was a neurobiologist, this is a distinction between the state of mind as encoded by neural activity versus the knowledge that is certainly of a uh, procedural sort um, that is encoded in the connection strengths or the weights. So if that's true, what that means is that, there, that inference is belief updating and learning is a much slower, different kind of process that underwrites the accumulation of knowledge. But you can't have beliefs about your knowledge. They're, 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 you, that would be a category error. But it would be possible to learn, and then that would um, create a different context for what you subsequently believed and talked about in a declarative way. So I would imagine it's perfect uh -huh. mm -hmm. to, for example, to change your knowledge literally by having, um, say, synaptic homeostasis during non-REM sleep. So you're yeah. actually changing um, in a structured and lawful way the pattern of connections in your brain that are the knowledge in a non-philosophical sense, such that when you entered a, um, a dream state or um, uh, when you're actually awake, you could then, your beliefs because they're conditioned upon your the parameters of your generative model or your connectivity would be uh, would be different and you 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 would you can use the reports i think as evidence that there has been some change in knowledge in a zero person um or um um you know, say a particular meditative state or in uh, in the context of um, non-REM uh, non sleep. So I think if you just take a very simple-minded view the, your, um, of knowledge versus beliefs and map that to the dynamics of the system as opposed to changes in the structure of the system, I think that, you know, there is a way of, of resolving that, um, that, that particular dialectic. Um, and just the other point, um, well, well, just to say, I, I think lucid dreaming could have been really usefully discussed in terms of this meta-attention and the 
um, the dissolution of certain higher level parts of a generative model when looking at the, inter the internal machinations of lower parts, the, the epistemic agents that in that in Thomas's uh, thought experiment with the, um, the the you know the control. I think that, and that tells you a lot about. Um, um, you know, different ways of, of modeling oneself and being aware of, of being aware. Um, uh, but what I wanted to say was just address that that, that question, actually, that not only um, did th that um, very useful monologue um, or commentary um, bring to the surface, but actually Thomas asked, asked earlier on, which is, you know, who wakes you up? Um, so, you know, what is the kind of action and is it epistemic and who did that? Um, mm -hmm. when, you know, when you when you come out of you know stage four um, um, in, in, into the, you know those few seconds of wakefulness before that uh, narrative kicks in, narrative that inherits from all the learning and the neuroplasticity that not only has accumulated during the previous day but also during uh, during during sleep. Um, and I would say, well, the, it, it's you that does that. Um, you know, it, it is. Biologically speaking, it's just the uh, circadian control of the um, the neuromodulatory systems that is carefully orchestrated. Um, so there's no great mystery about about why you wake up. Um, um, but from a sort of um, um, a more theoretical stance, what that reflects is something which I think is endemic to all of our sense making and all of our um, you know sort of um, um uh, perception uh, and indeed active active perception which is we are the author of our own sensorium you know this is just another aspect of this um um, um simple reading of active inference that that we are the authors of our sensory inputs and um much like talking and much like uh, uh, walking and much like everything that we do on the inside and the outside from an interceptive point of view is a realization of our plans you know so the, you know, when i walk the universe doesn't have that physics in it until i put it there how did it get there because i thought that's how the universe worked in my head so uh, oh. much of our reality is actually generated but only only in the first person in the sense that it has to be the product of a plan that has this temporal depth. So again, uh, it, paradoxically, that the notion of walking meditation is a perfect counterexample to that, to that notion. Maybe briefly, the transition from an ordinary dream into a lucid dream is exactly when the, what I call the epistemic agent model gets stabilized and also autobiographical memory that I've dreamt before uh, comes online. And something most people are not aware of is that during on ordinary non-lucid dreams, we have no control over our attention. That's an obvious empirical fact from sleep lab research. We cannot control our attention in a normal dream, in a lucid dream you are an attentional agent. That's the tra transition. And the interesting question, of course, is, is anything like lucid waking could actually exist. Thanks so much. It's it's absolutely wonderful hearing you two in conversation. Um, I have a ton of questions, but I'm going to try and give just a few quick ones. Um, earlier on, uh, you were talking about the modeling of self over time. And there was a big emphasis on the temporal nature and counterfactuals. Um, later on, I think you mentioned that we could potentially have a counterfactual without a temporal element. And that's hard for me initially to conceive of because it seems to me that as soon as we're engaging in counterfactuals, there's some sort of pro projection and experience of time, or at least as in this is not happening now or something like that. Um, and I think this possibly relates to, I love this, this, uh, where you talk about single body constraints and I love your, your <laughs> really interesting analogy of some sort of synthetic thing that has mul multiple embodied states. Um, it seems to me that you're getting into the problems of time and space and I have a, a slight follow-up. So I'd love to just posit those two points 
bring them together and ask, do you think, can you explain to me how we could have counterfactuals without that temporal nature? And do you think it's possible to have multiple temporal experiences if you had a multi-embodied being? Oh. Is this for you, Carl? Um, yeah. yeah, I think you should go first, though. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Crowds like that. Oh, okay. the, the, thing. the idea there are many levels of description on which the experience of pure awareness can be described. It can be described, um, for instance, as the phenomenology of tonic alertness, very down to the ground. You can describe it on an abstract level of description as epistemic openness, that is, as having a representation of the possibility of knowledge. That is counterfactual, but in my view, it's so abstract that it doesn't contain any a rep, any sub-representation of any concrete epistemic act, which of course would have to be one with temporal properties. Uh, I think of something very abstract there, which is actually a temporal. If that is computationally possible, um, that's that's the question for Carl, uh, I think. Um, if the, the full dissociation would be possible to have a mere, how would one say, model of counterfactual space without automatically co-representing any temporal properties. I think the phenomenology shows that this is possible, but I might be completely wrong. You know, it might be a misinterpretation. So, uh, well, let me pursue that then um, and give a very banal illustration of the, um, the distinction or the possibility of having um, a counterfactual um, opportunity in the absence of temporal depth that speaks to this possibility of knowing without actually committing to the, the route to that knowledge. Uh, or the, to that belief updating. Um, so mm -hmm. I, this is going to be a very subpersonal, um, uh, non-abstract example. But I'm going to use the, uh, again, the uh, control of our eye movements uh, just as a sort of worked example of how the answer, or why the answer to Thomas's last question was yes. You know, it is possible to compute this and it, is, and it, it probably occurs in our brains all the time, especially when we're awake, and interestingly, also during rapid eye movement uh, and dreaming sleep. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea here is that I've got lots of um, counterfactual possibilities about where to look next. You know, uh, they could be uncountable, but let's say they're coded in an extremely large uh, matrix of possible places I could look next, where I could epistemically forage, visually palpate the world. That appears to be encoded in something called a salience map in the deep layers of the superior colliculus. So you can literally watch over time the planning of the next eye, uh, the next eye movement emerge if you just imagine or and uh, and or image um, this map, this layer in this um, subcortical structure, this, uh, the the, um, um, the superior colliculus. Um, you can look at emerging islands of activity, uh, some, sometimes described as bumped attractors, that basically portend and specify where you're going to look next. And it takes time for this the, this map to evolve its activity. And I repeat, it's called a salience map in um, in visual the visual search literature. Salience just is the epistemic affordance that we were talking about before. It just is the expected information game. How much uncertainty am I going to resolve ah. if I looked over there? Uh -huh. The mathematically exactly the same thing. Interestingly, um, in the technical literature, also known as Bayesian surprise for for for, uh, for some reason. Um, but the key point I, I want to make here is that the the, the, the counterfactual latitude or, or breadth is just determined by the possibilities of where I can look. It's literally in the structure of the brain encoded by the number of neural populations that encode all the places that I could look. And the planning that we've been talking about is the, um, the competition between all of these counterfactuals to actually predominate 
and that will become the one that is selected. And that competition is underwritten exactly by um, the um, the expected free energy or the ba- the expected Bayesian surprise that has, uh, as we were talking about, these intentional and pragmatic or instrumental aspects to them. And it, but it takes time. Um, so if you wait um, a, a while, then you there will emerge a confident winner among all the counterfactual plans of action that are explicitly and quintessentially epistemic in nature. but And that's the temporal depth we're talking about. So let's imagine that we actually had um, a particular brain state, possibly associated with a particular tone of neuromodulation that, that is basically quashing the amount of time over which these patterns of activity in the superior colliculus can evolve. What would that look like? It would look as if I can't plan into the future. I can't plan where I'm going to look next. But because all the activity of the um, existing alternatives is still quite high because this lateral competition or the winner-take-all-like behaviour has not had time to evolve, it would look as if I'm still entertaining all possible locations I can look at. This is a possibility of knowledge written in terms of basic physiology of visual search. So it's perfectly possible to have a the, the counterfactual depth, but you don't use it in planning into the future. And that gives you a situation where everything is possible. And it's just I haven't decided which one to do next because I haven't rolled out because I'm in the moment, as it were. So I don't think there's any, there's any sort of um, difficulty in conceiving of and indeed writing down the mathematics of um, having lots of possibilities for an epistemically informed future or um, knowledge or uh, uh, you know, um, you know, perhaps knowledge is the wrong word given what we were talking about with the last question uh, but b- belief um, belief updating uh, f- uh, f- uh, in the absence or the presence of um, uh, the temporal depth of, of belief updating so I, I hope that sort of um, sort of resolves the, the problems but also I think foregrounds this rather I think quite lovely concept of the possibility of knowing uh you can have that in the moment even before you've decided your knowing pointing uh, uh um uh, knowing pointing behavior uh in time uh, um i think um we could we, we could we, I, will, I won't waste time answering this but i think that if i had time it would be really interesting just to connect time perception um to this hierarchical structure given that usually in these hierarchical structures um things unfold more slowly as you get deeper and deeper in so that you know we're talking before about um the autobiographical self uh you know, perhaps the narrative self the epistemic self that is um you know poised to model the world as it unfolds over seconds minutes and possibly even hours um, as opposed to the kind of machinery and belief updating I was just talking about that unfolds at a very low level over milliseconds. So as soon as you get this separation of temporal scale, there is a way, I think, to conceive of a relativistic kind of time perception. It's just basically how many belief updates do, happened at the lower level relative to how many times I updated my beliefs. Um, and of course, once you have that sort of relational aspect you sort of realize that time as a sort of metric it doesn't really make much sense it is another construct of belief updating and the dynamics which in principle should go away in the absence of any deep planning and that's exactly what we were talking about before that time is effectively dissolved or not not only does it not not only does it seem as if it stood still it just isn't there if you're not doing this deep planning and pursue, you're know, modeling the future um you know at each and every level of this hierarchical um you know, hierarchical structure a hierarchically structured belief updating that was such a beautiful explanation i was not following you until you you gave this kind of model on the visual when when you completed that it was just one of those lovely moments where something clicks i couldn't conceive of it all and i love that so yes that was a wonderful example um Thanks so much for that clarity. Thank, thank both of you for their comments. I have one other thread I want to pull. Um, I find it very interesting, particularly for Metzinger, but for Friston as well, how you blend and blur this line between Eastern and Western uh, schools of thought and take them both seriously and try and have them engage. 
Um, there's a particular question that I nag with a lot, which is the nature of con consciousness, the first person, the zero person, the multi-person perspective that you, you've hinted at so many times in this discussion and in your books and, and dialogues and interviews that you've published. Um, this is this is a little bit of a tricky one, but I want to bring up just for discussion's sake concepts like panpsychism or monopsychism and the idea that um, the consciousness might be like a fundamental property or a universal property or a, a dispersed property. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about the value uh, earlier, you brought up the concept of, of the difference between like, for example, the zero person perspective. Um, and Professor Friston, when you talk about your, your free energy principles, I was thinking about the concept of, for example, necessary insufficiency of what would entail consciousness, because it seems like in a sense, even something like an atom um, could be seen as following some of these free energy principle properties where it might meet some of the qualifications for a certain type of consciousness. Yet at the same time, it doesn't, you know, is there some degree of self-awareness and whatnot? I'm curious how low on the bioorganic spectrum you would consider this and if you started to you know you're talking about buddhist concepts like there's the whole kind of wave and ocean analogy that's used in many levels do you think the self is an illusory construct that appears within this this uniform um, field that we exist in and it's an excitation, almost like, a, a you know, people speak like a quantum field in a similar way. Or do you think there clearly are separate, individual, distinct and discrete consciousnesses that then interact? Is it strictly a neurological phenomenon? And I know you, you've commented on this before, but I'd just love to get your thoughts there, especially um, how this might relate to different ideas that are akin to panpsychism. And again, thank you so much for your time and, and thoughts on this. Maybe I should begin because I'm the more boring person here. I'm a very old fashioned person. <laughs> I think that <clears throat> consciousness is a physical phenomenon uh, that is very interesting because it is quite rare uh, uh, in, in this universe and that it is a local phenomenon. Um, I uh, think as in philosophers speak uh, that it locally supervenes, that means that as soon as the properties or the functional properties of your brain or even a subset of these properties are determined, all your phenomenal properties are also determined. So um, I don't think anything, say, think about active sampling or so, has to literally expand into the physical environment of the biological body. You could hallucinate or dream exactly the same phenomenal experience that accompanies which is a local phenomenon. The epistemology, the expansion of knowledge, that's all a very different uh, uh, thing. Um, but I want to point out why there is this panpsychism craze and why we find this metaphysics of panpsychism in certain circles, it has this fascination. And I think the reason is what I call the principle of phenomenological anchors, for every metaphysical model, a human being, a human philosopher has thought of like, everything is God, everything is consciousness, everything is inert matter. There is actually a possible altered state of consciousness that if you would interpret that model of reality would give you that metaphysics. What makes panpsychism, consciousness is everywhere, so fascinating is not this, as I think, pretty untenable metaphysical position at all, but that it gives you a certain inkling, a certain intuition. How would my world be if that were true? And there are actually altered states of consciousness, namely the so-called non-dual awareness of um, advanced practitioners, where the experience of consciousness is not contracted into an epistemic agent model anymore, but is a property of everything that is consciously experienced. So one of our participants describes, a number of them describes that phenomenology as I am the space in which everything happens. 
that seems to be a possible model of reality for human beings. So everything has this property of phenomenality, not only this knowing self. And what people find so fascinating about this one metaphysical option of panpsychism is that in trying to understand how the world would be if that were true, they ever they actually get an intuition of a very interesting altered state of consciousness, namely non-dual awareness. So um I've said in the book, there's one sentence, uh, panpsychism is the poor man's non-dual awareness. I don't know uh, if that makes any sense for you. <laughs> this, this, Thank this. you very much. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yeah, right. Thank you. And, and just, just really quickly to double check um, before first thing goes, so you would say that you, you think consciousness is a local phenomenon and panpsychism is an interesting, if I understand you correctly, it induces an interesting type of experience in that localized consciousness, but it would yes, that's an interesting way to think. And I also think you know human brains operate at a body temperature of thirty-seven degrees. Quantum phenomena play no role uh, at these temperatures. You know they are filtered out. This is. Um, I think there are no real good arguments why the world should be like this. If atoms, if electrons have a kind of proto-phenomenality, it just pushes the question back to why is our very interesting form of consciousness so much more complex? How do we get from that proto-phenomenality of an electron to that of a human brain? And then, you know, the problem is again unsolved. We have a large step to make a theoretical step that nobody knows how to take that step um yeah i um, i just don't believe panpsychism is true but local phenomenal models of reality in some higher vertebrates nervous systems can of course model non-dual awareness they can model a panpsychistic world that's what they can do professor friston before Professor Fisher, before you answer, Briar, in, in light of Michael Levin's work, no. what's your thought on that then? Because Levin posits the hard way itself is the cosmos, in fact, right? Because the bioelectrics and all, it's not localized and you cannot reduce it whatsoever. I'm sure, Professor Fisher, you are familiar with Michael Levin's work as much than everybody loves him. <laughs> What's your thought on that? My thought or, or Thomas's? Your thought. Oh, right. Well, I assume you're talking about basal cognition, but I I, I do think that that, that would be um, the kind of uh, localism or localist perspective that Thomas is, is referring to um, in the sense that it is, um, it is uh, space-time um, uh, structured. Uh, so it's distributed. Um, so it's not it's not if you like um, um, localized in the sense that, that that it is distributed, but it is distributed in a lawful way that enables um, you know what could be read as sort of mortal computation that the the belief updating is in the structure. The structure is the knowledge. I am a good model of my lived world. You know, in, in the in the true mm -hmm. genetic sense. Um, um, so I, I think Mike, Mike would be quite comfortable with, with the position um, that Thomas has so clearly um, <laughs> articulated. And if let me ruin it all again and, and introduce something mystical again. You remember that non-dual knowing AI example with those many epistemic agents. Could it be that Let's not talk about the universe. Let's talk about the process of evolution as it took place on this planet here. Could evolution as a whole not be fruitfully seen as an epistemic process that sacrifices billions of individual epistemic agents over millennia? Is that too metaphorical or does it make sense to anybody? Oh, no, no. That that completely does. I was actually 
one of the challenges of these uh, is the temporal nature of reality <laughs> that all of our consciousness will need to separate after this. But I was thinking it, it's so interesting with your metaphor because it feels a bit like certain concepts of reincarnation or, or different cultural metaphors that you have uh, a single agent, subjective agent, experiencing multiple embodiments. And so I, I could see that sort of viewing a, a collection of culture and knowledge base over time as being a kind of super agent, right? Which has been posited before, but these kind of super agents, you know, getting past the limits of biological temporality by having a culture and a shared knowledge base. So I'm not sure if that's a bit of what you're hinting at. The more interesting thing maybe in your in your multi multi embodied uh, mechanical example robotic example is would there be an individual consciousness in each one by definition or is there a single consciousness with multiple embodiments which brings up some complex issues of of what it means yes to be it does <laughs> yes it does <laughs> i think that gets gets too complicated to settle it right now <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm glad we have one question that's that complex, and I love it. Thank you so much. I have a question about this counterfactual death, and also sort of I want to connect this to suffering, uh, basically, and entropies as connecting to the to the uh, idea of suicidal November. This is very interesting. Um, am I right in saying that um, if suffering is equivalent to entropy? and we are trying to sort of minimize the entropy or uncertainty about the world. Um, in other words, by minimizing free energy, we are minimizing entropy, thus minimizing suffering or stress, let's say. Then in that case, in certain pernicious diseases uh, like depression, I'm thinking, I want to verify this with, with both of you. Am I right in saying that when you are suffering from depression, you are effectively uh, you have very pro precise priors, in other words, very shallow counterfactual or very low counterfactual depth. In other words, a very limited bubble of narratives in which you are, you are successful in minimizing your surprise. So everything is very, very determined. Now, if I'm right in saying that, you are in a state with minimized surprise, uh, very low counterfactual depth, very low number of narratives. But what's happening to your suffering? I don't like. Uh, can I say that by by extension, you can say that you are now also in the state of minimized suffering, like you're very comfortably numb, or it cannot be translated to that. And if if it cannot be, then going back to the original point. Is suffering equivalent to entropy? Um, and the last, uh, the, the second question, if there is time, if there is not, that's fine. Is that uh, if, like, when they cure depression, if that's the right word, and um, what is exactly happening to those priors? What are the neural correlates in the brain that are changing with these medicines uh, to sort of adjust these priors? Maybe so that you could actually go out there and accumulate evidence that, okay, I'm not a depressed person. Well, I think, I mean, I have talked to depressed patients in wards, but I think you have done more than that, more of that than I have. Uh, what is your understanding of depression right now? I'll say it's a really good question. I'm going to take um, depression as... Um, a particular example of a whole suite of um, so-called psychopathologies or indeed just pathologies um, and just pick up on what I think you, you identified as a key thing, which is there are certain ways of responding to the world um, that um, preclude um, the kind of epistemic um, responding to the epistemic affordances or imperatives that we've been talking about. So, Thomas, what what were the, what were the two um, philosophical divides? One was the intentional, the practical intentionality and theoretical yeah. intentionality. Right. So, if I'm reading the theoretical one as a sort of mo the more epistemic exactly uh, yes. information game. So, the, if if you um, find a way of um, eluding surprises that are um, the, uh, um, 
associated with the or expected surprise associated with the practical the pragmatic you know i um i do not expect to be abused like this by my family or my friends um and i find their behavior surprising and therefore i am going to um uh, divorce myself from that social or pro-social interaction i'm going to seclude myself and feel very sorry for myself and i'm going to be well happy feeling very sorry for myself because they're all ignoring me because i don't want to you know because um um i've now well in fact they're not going to ignore me at this stage but uh i don't have to you know engage with 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 that kind of surprising behavior where surprise is now read as uncharacteristic experiences given i am you know, who I am, and I'm meant to be a nice, likable person, so it's surprising to be treated like that. So that would be the practical, the pragmatic uh, surprise, or the uh, um, that would afford certain withdrawal behaviours um, with a pragmatic or instrumental or a practical affordance. But notice what we've done with that. These withdrawal behaviours now prevent exactly what you said, the theoretical epistemic behaviors so they preclude testing evidence that in fact the world has changed or i was wrong so i think that these are particularly pernicious um um base optimal ways of responding that can be um self-maintaining um and you see a lot of these things so for example uh, you, you we talked about um we talked about uh, depression um Agrophobia may be being another one, um, chronic pain being another one, chronic stress being another one. All of these things have something else in common. They're all really useful function responses in the short term. It's only when you don't um, um, suspend them and they become chronic do they become a pathology. So being uh, be responding in a, with a low mood or depression for a short period of time is actually you know, quite, quite protective. And in fact, you can argue from the evolutionary um, theorizing or theoretical biology that the fact we have the capacity to be depressed itself has, um, you know, is a result of positive um, selective pressure because it is protective. I withdraw from surprising, dangerous, upsetting situations. Same with stress. You know, if, if we weren't stressed um, and, uh, you know, put ourselves in the right kind of state of mind and body to respond to stressful situations, um, we wouldn't be here. Same with pain. If I didn't have a, a, reflex, a pain re reflex withdrawal, um, I would get burnt or uh, damaged physically. So the only problem with all of these so-called um, um, pathological or um, sort of negative valenced um, um, responses is that when they are self-maintaining, autopoetic in some sense, uh, mm -hmm. because they become enduring, do they become a pathology and you have to call the doctor or your priest or your friends? Um, uh, and that's only because they stop you this continual uh, indulging in this uh, quintessentially, sorry, in this... Um, in the thing that, it, that that makes us into the kind of thing we are, which is the curiosity, the, the drive to respond to 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 uh, uh, to those epistemic affordances. If you know, you take that away, then 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 I do become pathological because I can't now update my knowledge or my beliefs about a changing world. Um, so I think I think that's a really good example, and it sort of gives you a different perspective on 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 certain pathologies. Uh, there's usually a, a, a reason for them. Uh, it's just, as you say, you've got to put that theoretical intentionality back in play at the appropriate time. And that's, of course, what therapy does. And I would imagine, to a certain extent, what a lot of uh, therapeutic um, deployments of mindfulness and meditation is all about as well. You know, giving people back the, the, the ability to suspend their prior beliefs um and, and explore other ways of, of doing things because very often the you know the precision or the um the attention that we uh, deploy um at various levels of these generative models is not fluently un under uh, you know volitional control so i personally look at meditation as basically you know becoming an athlete on the inside 
you know, and becoming able to actually volitionally now redeploy your attention if you're really skilled right down to the level of your interception, which would be, um, again, that's another thing. I think, Carl, that was a real gem. Uh, you just created setting the concept of autopoiesis into that context, into that domain of a self-maintaining pathological dynamics. I thought that was a really original thought. I have less to contribute to your question. I I have one or two papers of suffering, and you may know that I have officially demanded a moratorium on official artificial consciousness two years ago because of the risk of creating artificial suffering, a suffering explosion, not an intelligence uh, explosion. I've thought about what could be the most abstract descriptors of what creates negative valences. And I basically, I come up with only two thoughts. One, it is it has always has to do with loss of control. Uh, so some space gets compressed and there is a preference for that space of being able to not ruminate depressively or have your attention locked on something. Uh, to for this space to be widened and you cannot widen this compressed space anymore you lose the control over certain kinds of internal actions and the other thing that is an abstract de description of negative valence is everything that th threatens the integrity of the currently running self model so we are systems which maintain their biological integrity by, for instance, using the conscious self model, the phenom phenomenal self model as a proxy and constantly optimizing its internal cohesion, trying to. Uh, that's uh, that's the way we work. And if we sense there's a serious danger of disintegration here uh, in the conscious self model, that is very negatively um, balanced. I can only add that Another perspective on your question may use the concept of a preference and of preference frustration. Um, many of the wisdom traditions, many ancient philosophers in the history of humankind has said that you can only end suffering if you have no preferences anymore. You know, the, that is a solution that in many different forms has always been offered as long you, as you have preferences for widening your space, optimizing your predictive horizon, optimizing control and extending it also into your social environment, uh, for instance, uh, then these preferences can be frustrated. And uh, that will always be negatively balanced. Um, that's all I can say at this point. Yes, uh, thank you, Avi. Now, I have a question, <clears throat> both for uh, Professor Christian and Professor Metzinger, and they are interrelated. You know, The question of self-organization systems, self-organizing systems, and how the whole idea of Markov, you know, <clears throat> boundaries are formed. And I want to connect it with the MPE, minimal phenomenal experience of the self not the self-experiencing, but the self itself, the definition of the self. Is it possible to build a clearer vocabulary around it where <clears throat> the, the self <clears throat> is actually losing a lot of the baggage as the boundaries have shifted inwards? You know, So when you have a self-system, you have boundary and you have an inside and outside. Now we think of the boundary shifting inwards. Is there a way of coming up with a better vocabulary? You know, that's my question. It, of, this uh, I, exists. Yes, it exists. Um, so there is a 2009 paper in Trends in Cognitive Sciences, which is entitled Minimal Phenomenal Selfhood, which I wrote uh, with uh, Olaf Blanke and which has been relatively impactful, where we try to define the simplest form of self-consciousness. Um, that we termed MPS. MPE is only the result of a number of people, my research assistants, continuously thinking, okay, if we have a well-defined notion 
of minimal phenomenal selfhood, what can be dis, uh, subtracted before we lose phenomenal awareness at all? What can you subtract? And um, you can subtract agency, you can subtract self-location in a temporal frame of reference, you can subtract uh, self-location in a spatial frame of reference, any form of abstract embodiment or full embodiment, and you still get conscious experience. And that led to this notion of MPE. Uh, it, it, and the whole quest for what would be the minimal uh, um, form of processing beyond which you just have the cessation of conscious experience. And of course, there's a lot of deep water here. It's easy to use that colloquially, as um, Carl said, use the term minimal. But we do not have conceptually priced criteria for minimality from philosophy, and we do not have mathematically precise um, criteria for minimality as a model I'd like to have them. So this is an, a very open question what minimal really means. And it's all we're doing is kind of trying to prepare for future research and to carefully approximate this. Um, but this is definitely uh, not a solution. But you have to see, bottom line, this concept of MPE, you have to see it in the concept, uh, in the context of MPS, right? Yes, yeah, just a follow-up question, uh, Professor Mitzinger. You know, the follow-up question is, <clears throat> so there is the self having a conscious experience, and there's the consciousness of that self itself, you know, because there is the boundary, right? That's why I want to bring in Professor Friston also into this conversation, which is to ask, when we use the word consciousness, is it a state of experience of the self, or it is self-conscious? You know what I mean? The distinguishing factor. Because oh. <clears throat> in a lot of non-dual traditions, in the non-dual traditions, they overcome that barrier by, yes. by using another language. Yes. Yes, they do. I mean, my provocative teasing claim uh, is that consciousness is not a subjective phenomenon. Conscious experience for almost all human beings and for almost all the time is a subjective experience because there is an experiencing self which is co-modeled, an epistemic agent model. That is why there's a perspective and that is um, why there is subjectivity. But the scientific problem is not the contents. I am saying the first person perspective is on the contents level, but the real question is the consciousness of it all the phenomenality of it all. And that's not a subjective phenomenon. And if that's true, if, for instance, Advaita Vedanta and these traditions show that there is a non-subjective, non-dual variety of awareness, this has the interesting consequence that it is wide open for scientific research because there is no irreducible subjectivity in this anymore. Um, you know, if the consciousness as such has no form of sub, of course it in, occurs in an individual system, you know, that's a weak version of subjectivity. But if there is no knowing self and no subjectivity, this eliminates all the arguments against, uh, for the irreducibility of consciousness. And I think most Advaitins would hate that conclusion. <laughs> But I think it's it's kind of staring in our face that if science would take those states that it is most suspicious about because it sounds flaky, vague, uh, vague, new agey, esoteric, if it would take those states, non-dual states seriously, that would be the entry uh, door because they are not subjective. I've tried to formulate this as the contraction principle. So I think phenomenality, strictly speaking, is a property of certain objective brain processes. And we have we have no theory, we don't understand why some of these processes appear. But 
the brain itself has a theory about what this property is. And it models it as the property of a knowing self that is conscious, you know. We try to understand it from the outside as a scientific community, if that's the epistemic agent. What makes this very small subset of computational processes in the brain phenomenal? What makes them appear to the organism? But the brain has long found its own answer on the subpersonal level to this question. And the, the answer is, yeah, there's a conscious self. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if that makes sense to you. Uh, yeah, well, it makes sense to me. I'm not sure the Persia <laughs> conquers. Um, yeah, I'll just close by um, responding to um, the, the, the request for science now uh, being licensed to um, deal with consciousness um, it, given you know, uh, if subjectiveness is, um, is is no longer an issue, um, there there is actually some effort. So I'm just going to tell a very brief story and point you to a paper that I'm not absolutely sure has been published yet. But before I do, you know, I think the kind of answers and and um, resolutions or offerings from um, a, you know a mathematical perspective are. Um, are only good if the, the, the if it's the kind of thing you're looking for. Um, so what I'm about to say may, may may be completely useless and irritating for some people. It may be useful for, for other people, depending upon um, how you like to think about things. But it's an interesting solution that touches upon a number of things, um, both in the question and the answer in terms of uh, Marco Blankett's irreducibility, uh, contraction and the like. Um, and the, the 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 formalism or one formalism actually inherits of something that uh, Professor Mitzinger introduced right at the beginning, which was sort of the minimal moral notion. So one of one of one of um, uh, uh, Professor Metzinger's uh, sort of mentees, uh, I'm not sure whether it's a student, but Vanya Weiss um, has been really trying to sell this notion of a minimal model of consciousness. That challenge has been taken up by a number of people collectively. Um, trying to find the common ground, which would be a min so this is not minimal uh, phenomenal experience. This is just a minimal model of consciousness. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, and um, basically, has they, they they were tasked with writing a paper um, that tried to drill down on the mechanics um, of a minimal model of consciousness using the Markov blanket formalism, based upon the notions of Chris Fields who is a quantum information theorist nothing to do with microtubules wow. it's it's it, you know he he um is much more sensible than that um and the paper um basically says that there may well be um a substrate a localist substrate for um the kind of um uh, belief updating that would be necessary to equip it with the notion of uh, you know with a phenomenality that is technically an irreducible Markov blanket. So what does that mean? It means that within the Markov blanket, you're in, say, a subsystem of the brain, which might be anatomically quite distributed, there can be no further hierarchical levels. Therefore, there's no opportunity for mental action inside uh -huh. the Markov blanket, uh -huh. which means that this particular belief updating scheme or substrate can only become aware of its own mental actions via the consequences delivered from the rest of the brain, if you like, all those other little epistemic agents in the thought experiment. So there is a unique um, Markov blanket that could have this, it can't be reduced any further in the sense that, um, um, in the sense that it doesn't have any Markov blankets within it that would have this property that it's it can only see itself through um, through through stuff which is not itself, and um, and this has been looked at from the point from the point of view of a number of people. Um, I won't go through it because I said I'd just tell a short story, but just an interesting sort of sh um, small world here. Um, the 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 mental action, of course, that 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 would constitute the active states of this irreducible Markov blanket. Um, um, looks as if they are the very 
um, um, cells, or the cells of origin of the ascending neuromodulatory systems that we started off talking about, which pleases Mark Soames enormously, uh, because that <laughs> the way, that's the only way that this minimal Markov blanket book can act upon the world to events evidence for its own existence. But of course, it doesn't know it's a thing, but you know, because it's it doesn't have that meta attentive aspect, because by definition, it's a uh, it's an irreducible Markov blanket. Anyway, that's the story. It took 16,000 words to write down. It was written at the request, I think, of Graham Horswell at the Journal of Consciousness Studies, who then looked at it and said, well, awfully sorry, we can't publish this. It's too long. <laughs> so, so I don't think it's ever been published. Um, but uh, if you, it, it might have gone on to some archive last year. Um, so you're looking for co-authors that sort of include Chris, Field, Chris Fields and uh, Maxwell Ramstead and the Active Inference crew who are really celebrating this, uh, let's try and take seriously the notion of a minimal model. Uh, let's look at it through the lens of the free energy principle and the Markov blanket uh, formalism, and let's see how it pans out. Um, so if you can't find it on the web, and it won't, it won't be published yet, I don't think, um, um, then you can email me and I'll and I'll I'll, I'll try and uh, try and find you a draft. But Thomas, I thought you'd like that because it's got it's got um, no more no more reducibility. It's, it does exactly the right kind of contraction. Uh, it's got it's got you know uh, it's, it's got all mental action built into it. It's uh, but mm -hmm. I repeat, extremely stimulating. I I hope I get hold of it. <laughs> Okay. Very, very interesting, uh, I can only say. Thank you. So uh, my question is this, uh, does this create a kind of an, uh, uh, epistemologically it kind of creates of an, a loop for us to uh, where we cannot know anything which cannot be reduced back oh, okay. uh, to our sensory input? Also, very quick answer just to this. We are, of course, embedded in higher order social epistemic systems like scientific communities who make theories, write papers, and do experiments. And that's the way out of this skeptical challenge, as philosophers would say, if you just have individual sensory perception. That's, you know, doing science, uh, doing this in a group. Um, that is the way um, to in which we have actually, I think, solved this challenge. We know so many things about this physical universe right now, which our senses could, could have never told us. Uh, uh, so I don't think it's a real problem, but if you were a sole human being <laughs> uh, on some planet, then you might have this epistemic, epistemological problem if I understood your question correctly, which I may not have, um, it's it's an age old, centuries old debate between empiricism and idealism, also in philosophy. Where the British were always the empiricists, the Anglo-Saxon tradition is always <laughs> the down to earth tradition. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just thinking that um, you know, doing it in groups, and you want to find a group with a big <laughs> telescope or a a, a a very big microscope just to uh, extend the scope of our sensations. That would be uh, uh, just to say that um, yeah, interesting philosophical problem. Um, I, I think if I was Helmholtz, I would say no. If you, if you can't sense it, you can't measure it, you can't observe it. Uh, it doesn't exist. Um, that's the whole point of physics. Um, and both quantum physics and most methodological uh, takes of physics. Um, on the other hand, that doesn't mean to say that latent causes are exactly what all of perceptual um, perceptual inference is trying to discern. So if it has any way of impressing itself upon your sensory organs, um, however indirectly or vicariously, then ultimately, yes, you can make inferences about these what are called latent or hidden states in artificial intelligence. Um, so that would be um, not treating it as a, an epistemological problem, uh, but uh, you know um, um, the the target that perceptual inference is trying to or active inference is trying to uh, trying to hit. Well, I can only say that I have 
thoroughly enjoyed this and uh, it has been extremely stimulating and one of the many things i've learned just from the last discussion we've had is is that there is actually there's something like a possible new research uh, frontier um, emerging if one could get the best analytical epistemolo epistemologists i'm not one of those uh, from my discipline to really look into Bayesian mechanics, statistical physics, all the things uh, from an epistemological perspective. This could be extremely fruitful uh, for a deeper understanding of the whole enterprise. I think this could be a very interesting, I will not be part of it because I have both expertise, but this could be another important interdisciplinary con uh, connection. Uh, an interaction that has unexpected results. Because I saw the question surfaced many times. What kind of knowledge is it actually that is gained here? So thank you very much. I, I enjoyed this very much. So as we near the end of our wonderful conversation today, I would like to ask both of you about upcoming events or projects that uh, you're excited about that you want to share to us today before you go? <laughs> well, I'll go first because I'll give you my usual answer. The, 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 there aren't any. So I, I, I'm <laughs> doing these things. Now you've got to leave. You know, I need to go and have a nice cigarette and a bit of peace. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but uh, you know, part of this was, I think, um, for me, inspired by by, by Thomas's book, um, and it is it is a prefactory um, exercise uh, and a, a monumental piece of work. So, I, I, perhaps it would be appropriate for Thomas's to sort of you know foreground um, you know the, the, where we go from here with that particular um, um, sort of announcement of, of the completion of that of that of that part. Of the journey to understand minimal phenomenal experience well as i said this is all going to be freely available to you by february 6 and um i'm thinking the main objective in my life the main insight i have is that i have worked very hard for 40 years now and that i do not want to do this in the future <laughs> and uh uh, I want much more silence and also solitude in my life. So I don't know how far I'll go it, but I've also created a small foundation um, that will support research of this kind. I'm currently also looking for donors. But one idea I have is to put a small uh, price out, an annual price for the best contribution to computational phenomenology of pure awareness. So... Um, the question would be if Carl would rather be on the jury or win the prize next year. <laughs> That's something to think about. Um, I will need some experts to improve on that preliminary model we've put out there. Well, Professor Friston, you want to win the prize or you want to be the jury? I <laughs> think I'm going to be on the jury. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we wrap up, I would I just want to thank, uh, give huge thank you to both of you for joining us today. Your insight have been incredibly valuable to us, and we wish you both well in your ongoing research. And sincerely hope to continue this future discussion. Thank you for your precious time and your wisdom. Can everybody unmute and wish everybody say thank you to yeah. them before they leave, please. Thank you. Gi giant thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much. We see thank you. Thank you for all the work you put into this. Thank you, Professor. No, I enjoy that. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope you all well. Have a good holiday. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.